Do you remember down in the days when they had it down the Washington Park or down at the Albany Public Library? They used to have those those chess things on a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Did you ever play in any of those? Uh So, so what shall I call you? Howard. Howard. <laughs> no, what's your, what, what's your, you're, you're the counselor? Uh, yes. We adjust my counselor. We adjust my counselor. At the vet center in Washington? Uh, vet center. Central, Central Island, excuse me. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Today, is part of the grant entitled, It's Time Has Come, Supplementary Materials for Teaching the Vietnam War. We had the pleasure and honor of interviewing Mr. Howard Johnson. Mr. Johnson currently is a readjustment counselor at the Vet Center at Central Avenue. And first, in the name of the teacher center, I would, certainly would like to thank you very much for putting up with the, the lighting and putting up with everything else here. Uh, when it seems to be the middle, I am not, I'm afraid. Can you kind of give us a little background on yourself uh, before you got to Vietnam? Uh, you know, where you were born, your high school years, this type of thing, just so we can kind of put you in the time frame. Okay, well, I was born right here in Albany, lived here pretty much all my life, and I uh, went to high school at Albany High, and I graduated Albany High in 1967, and I went in the Marine Corps in 1968. Had you uh, enlisted or, or were you drafted? No, I enlisted for three years. Were you aware, uh, were most high school kids in Albany aware of the Vietnam War and its, uh, uh, its implications or what was going on there? Were you personally aware of it before, during your high school years? Had there been much time spent on it, discussion among kids, this type of thing? Uh, oddly enough, no. When I, when I joined the, the Marine Corps, probably the Vietnam War was the furthest thing from my mind. I, I really hadn't, didn't know that much about it. I wasn't watching a lot of TV. You know, I was out playing sports, going to dances, hanging around with my friends. And uh, a lot of my friends weren't in the military and hadn't, you know, hadn't been in the military, so I wasn't really familiar with it. I mean, I knew it was going on, but it wasn't really something that had touched my life yet. Did you, so you did not list specifically to go to Vietnam. No, you had no one. You had real no intentions of, uh, of going to Vietnam. <laughs> you didn't. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> can we can we put you in Vietnam then? So you were you enlisted. Were you aware uh, during enlistment? Was there any peace uh, uh, peace type of things going on in the city? Long that you remember? <clears throat> no, not no, not not that I remember. Actually, I think Albany, compared to a lot of other places, was pretty low key, except for the university. And the university, especially in those days, was really so removed from the community, being way out on Washington Avenue, and you know the community being, you know, back down here, there really wasn't any any kind of peace connection that I remember. Yeah, that that's a, a point that he took me to. You know, he said uh, because he was at the state university for a while. And it was a small, I think he described it as a small but active peace movement. But part of it was the location. You know, it was, it was isolated out there. So, you know, uh, whatever demonstrations took place out there really didn't affect the rest of the city. And Albany, you know, Albany's always been a pretty conservative town. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was in school just, uh, I think it must have been doing Kent State, I can't remember, I was doing my graduate work up there. And that's the only thing I can remember uh, was they closed down the school for the spring semester, maybe the last month or so. We had to finish classes. Uh, uh, we finished them down right by the park on, on Lake, uh, the where the teacher's house was, I can't remember. It was a lady. And so uh, it probably doesn't seem to have been affected by, uh, by, by the peace movement. Uh, so you, you enlisted. What happens next, Howard? Well, the way the Marine Corps worked at that time was it's, you'd go down to, uh, down to the post office you enlist for, I would like myself, I enlisted for three years. About three weeks later, <clears throat> I went back down and uh, they put me on a plane to Paris Island, South Carolina. And uh, took got off at the airport and I took a bus, or actually I took a taxi 
to the Greyhound bus station and uh, I waited for the bus to come pick me up and takes you to Paris Island. And the odd thing about Paris Island, the Marine Corps, is they always bring you there at nighttime. Everybody always goes in at night. I never do that. Yes, and then, so, you know, here I am, this young, you know, this young kid, you know, being uh, down in South Carolina, I never was there before, waiting in this bus station with all these people I didn't know. You know, I get on the bus and they, and they bring us into the bus, coming to Paris Island, it's dark, it's, Paris Island is right on the coast, it's around a lot of swamp, you know, and right on the ocean. And, and you go in and they bring you to the receiving center, it's all these yellow footprints, and, and the guy comes on, well, the, deep, the drill instructor comes on the bus, and the uh, thing that I remember, he says, here at Paris Island, we don't walk. We either, we either double time or we march. Uh -huh. and he says, when I tell you to get off this bus, I want all you uh, <laughs> people <laughs> to uh, get on those yellow footprints. And uh, we all ran off the bus, and we're standing on these yellow footprints, and I guess there, there had to be about five or six handlers, the eyes. And they were screaming at us and yelling at us, and you know, it's confusing. You know, you don't know where you're at. You must be scary as hell. I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't do officer of gentleman based on that experience. It was, remember officer of gentleman who was right. the who was the guy Gossett? Right. Oh, Gossett. he was so good. Remember when he talks to those kids at the beginning. Pretty you know? much, it's like that. Yeah. I mean, probably if you want to get a real good idea of, of Marine Corps boot camp, at least back then. There's a movie out about Vietnam called Full Metal Jacket. And I think about the first 40 minutes of the movie deals with the Marine Corps boot camp. Mm -hmm. And the DI there is actually, a, it was a real DI. And it was pretty much like that, a little worse. I mean, some things they just can't put in, can't in, <laughs> in the movies, you know? Uh, uh, can, can you date your, uh, uh, your arrival at Paris Island? Uh, February, February, yeah, I believe it was February 68. February 68. Yes. So you arrived, uh, Tet was what, January 68? 68. Uh, was there news about Tet when you got there? Was it, was it? No, actually in boot camp, you're pretty, uh, you have to understand that in Marine Corps boot camp, when I was, you weren't even allowed to talk without permission. Jeez. And, uh, it's not like, you know, you, nine to five, then you go down to your local newsstand and get a newspaper, and uh, everything was really censored. Um, your whole focus was on being a recruit, learning what it was about to be a Marine, and uh, your day started pretty early in the morning. I think we got up like 5.30, 6 o'clock, something like that, and then we went for a three-mile run, a four-mile run, and we come back to our, our barracks, and then from there we go to Chow, then after child, we come back to the barracks and make our, our beds. They call them racks in the Marine Corps and clean the place up. And then your your training day starts. And uh, you train all day long. You march in formation and you do a lot of uh, calisthenics and learn about little different things. A lot of Marine Corps history in boot camp, which is a little different from the Army Marine Corps boot camp, they teach you a lot about Marine Corps history mm -hmm. and traditions of the Marine Corps, um, the uniform. And also at that time you, you uh, became uh, acquainted with your M14 because we had M14 to boot camp, not M16s. And you learned how to shoot, and how to take apart the blindfold and put it back together, and you learned the basic functions of a 45, and you know those those kind mm -hmm. of things. Was there any specific training des designed uh, uh, to prepare Marines for, for Vietnam? I think so. The, I think that probably the. Uh, the one thing that they teach you is discipline, to be able to follow orders without question. And, and, and a lot of that they do through close order drill, because you do a lot of close order drill, so when you know, the DI says left face, everybody goes left face at the same time. You turn at the same time, every foot hits the ground at the same time, and, and you do a lot, of, a lot of that, and I think that really teaches the discipline, to, to react instead of act. Uh -huh. Was there, was there any specific training for guerrilla warfare, how to deal with uh, no, that not, type of warfare? No, not in the Marine Corps, because in the Marine Corps, you go to boot camp, and boot camp at that time, I believe, was, uh, I was fog, I think 12 weeks. And then from, and after you graduate out of boot camp, 
then you go to what Marine Corps calls ITR, Inf Infantry Training Regiment. That's where you learn all your battle tactics. Okay. So at the end of boot camp, the bus comes back, you get on the bus, and then they take you to North Carolina, Camp Lejeune, which is about a six or seven hour drive. And from there, you get into your infantry company. Because in boot camp, you get your MOS, whether you're going to be uh, infantry or supply or the office or whatever your job is going to be, you get your MOS. So if, you, if you're in the infantry, then you go to an infantry training regiment, and that was eight weeks long. If you were going to be in the support services, you, all, you only had to do four weeks of infantry training. And in the Marine Corps, they believe that everybody's a rifleman, even if you're in supply. So you have to learn how to shoot all the basic weapons that the Marine Corps has in the field. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that they don't train you on is artillery. But they trained, they gave some training on 81 mortars, uh, machine guns, M79 drill, grenade launcher, flamethrower. That's when you get your M16, you shoot that. They give you some training in uh, demolitions and raids and ambushes and more conventional type of warfare, house to house kinds of things. And, you know how to do that, plus all the physical training that goes along with it. But they're not as strict with you. You know, you, you have a little more freedom in, in ITR. Mm -hmm. So that's, my original MOS was supply, and I only had to do four weeks of that. So I did four weeks of my infantry training, and then I got a 30-day leave, I went back home, and then I had to come back to Camp Lejeune and go to supply school. But in the meantime, I guess they had lost a lot of infantrymen in Vietnam. While I was waiting to go to school, they changed my MOS to what they call a 0311, which is your basic infantry unit. Mm -hmm. And I had to go back to four more weeks of infantry training. And that's when you picked up the, the tactics? Uh, well, more. I picked up more tactics. Uh -huh. you, you get them in your first four weeks, but they're not as in-depth. And when you're in the infantry, then they're, you're more in-depth in the training. So I picked up some more there. Uh, do, do, you, do you feel that what the preparation you had, maybe we're looking ahead a little bit, so if you want to look at it later on, did you feel that the preparation you had uh, in boot camp uh, did prepare you for what uh, was going to happen there? Somebody, I think it was Hal, said they can, uh, they can train you, but once you get there, it's a whole different critter, quote unquote, you know. Did, did you did you feel your training prepared you for what your, what was going to happen as far as uh, uh, you know basic guerrilla tactics? Well, I would have to say no. I don't think that yes and no. I I don't really think any amount of training can really prepare you for you know for that. Um, it kind of gives you a little outline of kind of what's going to happen, but. Uh, Things just aren't that orderly anymore. Yeah, that's what <laughs> So you, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's for sure. You know, you can't. I mean, in the Marine Corps, I mean, they were very honest with us. I mean, I remember boot camp. You know, they said probably half of you are going to die. You know, and and half of the other half is, or more, are going to sustain wounds. You know, and there are people walking around here that won't be walking in here from now because they won't have any legs. And so they were, you know, in terms of that. I mean, you know, they were they were very upfront with us, but in terms of the actual tactics and fighting, and I mean, we, I mean, we did some of that, but I think some of it too, you kind of wing it, depending on where you are and what's going on. While you were in boot camp, uh, was there any general reaction of the black soldier himself towards the war? Was did you know? Do you recall any, you know, any any kind of uh, discussions along those lines? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking. Mohammed Ali, it must was it must have been right about that time that he refused induction, and maybe yeah, I'm getting ahead of the story a little bit. But like Martin Luther King, it, it was around that time that he really started to uh, be very very critical of the war. Was that discussed among black soldiers uh, in boot camp? In boot camp, no. no. The penalty for talking. <laughs> no, I forgot you can't talk. And, yeah. and, and your whole focus. See, that's politics in there, and really, there are no politics, at least when I was in the Marine Corps, uh -huh. there were no politics. You were just trying to survive boot camp. I mean, you had three DIs that were on your case all the time. And, you know, if 
you were always doing something, even when we were back in our squad day. Uh, if you weren't spit shining your shoes, you were polishing your brass, you you're cleaning what they call your web gear, or you're cleaning your rifle, or you're reading what they call the Marine Corps handbook, which was basically all the weapons they had and how you put them back together. And, and if you were caught talking, they would do things to you like uh, they'd make everybody would pay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do two, three hundred push ups, you know, two or three hundred what they call bends and thrusts. Or, they had this, we had our DI, had a little thing called watching television. And uh, <clears throat> you'd get down on your toes and on your elbows like this. And you stand up on your elbows and your toes. And then he would say, pull out the cord. And then we'd have to walk around our squad bay on our elbows and our toes and pull out the cord. And you have to remember there were 80 people in our platoon. So this, this squad bay held 80 people. So we'd all, you know, we'd be doing that. We had another thing they call hanging around, because we had bunk beds. And if people were caught hanging around, at the end of the bunk bed was a footlocker. And what you would do is that you would get up on the footlocker and you'd put your arms over the end of the bunk bed and they'd kick the footlockers out from under you mm. so you'd hang around. Or they'd put us, crowd us all in the shower together and turn on the water. And <laughs> So your, your training is more intense than anybody else. Definitely, it's been it was more intense than the other services I talked to. Oh, the Marine Corps, I would say. It's say, no question from what you told me. No question whatsoever. Oh yeah, they were, you know, dig holes and sure. So you know, your focus, you weren't thinking about you know what was going on in the outside. All you were thinking about, because you, I mean, there was no radio, there was no TV, and there were no newspapers. So you're, is so you're isolated. All you know is what they want you to know. How'd you find out you're going to Vietnam? Um, I don't find out I was going to Vietnam. Well, when they changed my MOS, I knew I was going to be going then. Um, and uh, after I finished my training, I got orders. I got another 30 days leave, and my orders said Westpac, and Westpac meant Vietnam. Oh, dear. That's what Westpac means, you're going, you're going overseas. So from there, after I finished my training in Camp Lejeune, I went home again for 30 days. Then I came, then I went to Camp Pendleton in California because in the Marine Corps, they also give you another 30 days of training. Well, actually it was 28 days of training in a place in Camp Pendleton called uh, Las Pocas. And that's where you really get into jungle fighting and. They teach you about booby traps, and you do some more stuff with demolitions, and you go through these mock-up uh, Vietnamese villages and, mm. and, and that. And I think that probably that was the most uh, intense training in terms of learning about what it was going to be like in Vietnam. You know, you, you play these war games where you're prisoner of war and, and, and those sort of things. And then after that, after that training, after that 28 days, we boarded, a, we boarded a plane down in El Toro, California, which is a Marine Corps air base. And uh, I remember it was a, a Braniff jet. And uh, we flew we flew from El Toro to Hawaii. We had a two-hour stop in Hawaii to gas up. And then we flew nonstop from Hawaii to Okinawa, which is really a giant Marine Corps base. I mm -hmm. mean, that's the majority of people occupying that since World War II. But the Air Force and the Army were there. And Green Berets uh, operated out of, out of uh, Okinawa. And then we stopped in Okinawa for several hours. And then from Okinawa, they flew us to Da Nang, <coughs> uh, South Vietnam. And then we got off the plane at Da Nang. And then that's when they assign you to either the 1st Marine Division or the 3rd Marine Division. And the 1st Marine Division was, was um, around Da Nang in the, the lower I-Corps. And the 3rd Marine Division was up in the northern I-Corps, up in the DMZ and the Laotian border, and a place called Kantian, all, all that area around there. Did the Marines go over as a unit, or did they go over? Are you well, no, we went over as a unit, if you want to say a unit, we went over as a unit, the unit that you were in uh, Camp Pendleton with. 
all of us went over together. Um, but as soon as you got there, everybody went, went different places. So you were subject to, to that Darrow system as well as everybody else, oh, individual, right. individual replacement. Right. Um, yeah, we'll, I will, I'd like to talk about that later because that seems to be, uh, it seems to come up a lot over the course of the last summer, the, the concept of the Darrow system and uh, mm -hmm. uh, why it developed and uh, some, of the, at least some of the harmful effects uh, of the system. What's your first impression on the land? My first impression? My first impression, as soon as you got off the plane? Uh, probably very much like everybody else, pretty hot. hot. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the heat and the confusion. I, I remember when, you know, when I got getting off the plane seeing uh, an F-14 Phantom take off, I thought that was like... <laughs> uh -huh. You know, so it was... I can't say I was scared, but I was like wondering because it was just so different. I hadn't seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. I had never been in a war zone before, yeah. so I didn't you know, really know what that was about. How old were you then? About 19? No, I was 18. 18 years old. What, where were you assigned to? Uh, third Marine Division. The third Marine, so. When I got to, Na got to Da Nang, they assigned me to the Third Marine Division, and then I took a C-130 transport plane up to uh, Dong Ha. <clears throat> and then from Don High, I took a truck back down to Pine Tree, which is about, I don't know, I guess it must have been about five or six miles apart, if that. Uh -huh. and, that's, and so for your, was it 366 days? That's, uh, did Marines stay in the year and a day? No, Marine Corps uh, did 13 months. Did 13 months, so you did a lot longer than that. Right, Marine Corps always has to do one better than <laughs> yeah. the rest, so they added an extra month. Okay. Did, uh, so that's where you basically were assigned during the course of the war? Well, how it worked was like, Quang Tree was like our, what they call our rear, rear area. That's where, that's where our first sergeant was at, and that's where battalion headquarters was, was at. So from there, I got, I went to Quang Tree, and then uh, I met my company, which was, at this time they were guarding this bridge, it was about maybe, Ten miles north of there, so I got on a truck and they took me to my company. And when I got to my company, they assigned me to a platoon and to a squad, and uh, that's where my tour began. Mm -hmm. Did you finish there? Did you? You were basically there then for the entire thirteen months. And now. No, I was all over. I was. Uh, well, I shouldn't say all over. I, my company patrolled part of the DMZ over near the Laotian border and around, or basically around that area. Very mountainous jungle terrain. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much where we were, were the whole time. And it's very difficult to, to, to know where you're at because even the maps they gave us, if you had a map, only had the, the part of the country that you were in. They're all topographical maps. I mean, you know, there were no towns, no villages. You know, just mm -hmm. grid squares. Uh, when we talked about it, we, you know, and I, I've always make a point of saying that we, we really don't want to do war stories with this project, but are there any experiences or anything over there you think might be important to share with high school students as, as far as, a, you know, incidents or things that took place within inside the country itself? Well, short of war stories, huh? I don't know, for, for, for me, the, the, the thing that really uh, struck home for me, uh, people think about war and they think about fighting all the time. And, and, and I found that uh, there are a lot of other things that go on besides fighting. Uh, like, for instance, uh, most people in this country, and, and I do say, you know, America, I mean, they don't know what it's like to go like two, three days without water, you know. Um, same amount of time without food. And it's not like you just sit around and still, you know, we're climbing mountains, we're going out on night ambushes, and we have to stay up all night long. Um, uh, a lot of people in this country don't know what it's like to have your clothes rot off because of the humidity and, 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 the, and the wetness over there. And I can remember, you know, going a week without seeing my feet, not taking your shoes off, um, being sick, and not really being able to, you know, to do anything about it, the flies and, the, you know, and the rats and, you know, just the the environmental kinds of things that you that you have to put up with the boredom. 
you know, the intense heat, you know, th those kinds of things. I think that I think those are things that that really don't get talked about about war, particularly the Vietnam War. Like uh, I remember the first time I went out on patrol, uh, we used to have to tie our our sleeves down and tie our pants legs down because uh, you go out on patrol and the leeches would get on you. And they, you know, that's how they would get in. They crawl up your pants leg mm -hmm. or they drop one. They get on and crawl up your arms. You know, when we came back off patrol. Everybody would strip down naked, and then people would, you know, look, search your body for leeches. And, and the way you get a leech off you is you, you light a light a match, you blow it out, and, and you touch it in the back, and it, it backs out, and you, you know, you kill them. You know, people. You know, somebody takes ten leeches off you. <laughs> yeah. And then you can get infections from those, and just those those kinds of things. They go on day after day after day after day. You know, you lose weight. Uh, you develop dental problems because water is so scarce, so you don't brush your teeth with it for drinking. Um, something as simple as going to the bathroom by yourself, you, you, ne you never do that because when you go to the bathroom, somebody else goes with you to make sure it's some, that you, you don't get ambushed or somebody sneaks up on you. So the whole privacy thing is, uh, is very intense. Mm -hmm. Had you, uh, at this point, started to develop or, or form any opinions about the war from a political point of view? Or is it still, you know, is it still something to be in the future? Yeah, in the future, I have to say, and I can only speak for where I was at, <clears throat> but uh, we had a saying, and you know, there, uh, there are no politics in the bush. I mean, because we're talking about survival here. Right. And s survival super supersedes everything. I mean, you're not worried about whether the, the war is right or wrong. You're, you're worried about, you know, you get a report that there's an NBA regiment or a company in the area. I mean, you're watching out for that. Uh, you're worried about getting watered or getting artillery shot at you. So you're not really talking about the political part of the war. You know, you say, the war sucks, you know, I don't want to be here. But that's more environmental kinds of things, I believe, that I remember talking about. And generally, the, the, the things that, that we talked about, like, uh, I believe one of the reasons that you find that people talk about they get very close in Vietnam is because we talked about what we wanted to do after we you know, got out of the war. Hi, babe. Take it. Take a break. Sure. See, that's, uh, that's, that's the little blonde right there. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is Mr. Johnson, Cap. Yeah. This is Dorothy's call friend. Me Howard. Howard, this is Dorothy's friend. Beverly. Yes. Let's see where you got it from. Okay. 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 Are you going to be the audience? <laughs> So you're saying there was no no politics in the bush. Survival uh, basically was uh, was what was what it was about. Exactly. Uh, I can't I can't remember truly not one time where people where any of us talked about whether the war was right or wrong or or anything. I can remember the paper that we used to get was the Stars and Stripes. Which, the, yeah. Which was generally, you know, that was a lot of propaganda. Um, the thing that, that strikes me the most about the Stars and Stripes was I was, uh, the year that Albany had that real big snowstorm in 1969 where the police, I guess, were on snowmobiles I remember and the whole thing. Yeah. Well, I was, uh, obviously I was in Vietnam and that particular day it was about 110. <laughs> and, you know, that, and that, that was another thing, surviving the heat, getting, yeah. you know, getting used to the heat, um, real, in, real intense heat. And we carried, I carried the M60 machine gun. I was a machine gunner for, for a long time. And, uh, you know, we, you're talking about, you know, my machine gun weighed 26 pounds and my pack, you know, especially when we first went out in the bush, probably weighed anywhere from 80 to 90 pounds, you know, plus I had to carry 
the, some ammo for the machine gun. It was in these little boxes, 200 pounds like that, and that probably went about 20 pounds. So we're talking about, you know, walking around with all that kind of stuff on and uh, climbing mountains and going through triple canopy jungle. And so you got your exercise. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, you, you, since you were kind of isolated, uh, would the Stars and Stripes be the only source of information you had? Well, some people got packages, and in packages, you would, you know, you would get newspapers, and you know, sometimes you read the newspaper, uh -huh. maybe. But when you got a package, the uh, most important thing wasn't the newspaper because you have to remember we ate everything out of cans, and uh, when you got packages, maybe somebody would send you some Kool Aid or, oh, okay. you know. Uh, Different kinds of canned stuff that you know that we didn't get the sea rats there, or cookies and cakes, and you know the, those those sort of things. So that was the thing that you were really interested in. Would you uh, could, can you draw any parallels between the experience of the, the black veteran uh, in Vietnam as compared to the white veteran during your 13 months there? Are were there similar experiences uh, uh, between white veterans and black veterans there in Vietnam? In Vietnam. See, I think so. I think that, so you have to, when you're in the jungle, like I said, it, it's survival. So, you know, there are no politics in the jungle, and generally there's no color in the jungle. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if we have one canteen of water, and we're out there, we're going to share that water. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to worry about whether you're white, black, or whatever. Mm -hmm. and the main thing is that we both stay as healthy as we can, so if we get get hit when, you know, get in a firefight, you can protect me and I can protect you. Um, we dig our fighting holes together, um, we share our food together, we share our clothes, we share our ammunition. So it, out, out, out in the jungle, that's, that's how things went. But we, when we came back in the rear, it was a whole different story. I mean, there was, uh, from, what I, from what I can remember seeing and being part of in Vietnam, it was uh, pretty segregated. Uh, pretty much white soldiers went their way, black soldiers went their way, and, and uh, sometimes Hispanic soldiers and, and Native American soldiers uh, would swing either way. Mm -hmm. it, it depends. Um, plus there were Samoans there, and there were Canadians there, and uh, they, they, kind of, they were kind of off on, on their own, too. There's no forced segregation, though. No. Like no. you would have seen during World War One or Two. No, it was it no by choice for the most part. Right. Um. Before we leave Vietnam, is there anything else that, uh, that you think might be appropriate? We can always come back and talk. Sure. It, it's camera can do, does magic tricks. Uh, I'm sure you must recall call the left. Oh yes. I left Vietnam, oddly enough, in a, on a ship, because... Uh, You're the first one I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> that is oddly enough. Because in 1969, if you remember, it was uh, towards the end of 1969 when Nixon started winding down the war. Right. And what he did was basically was pull the 3rd Marine Division out of Vietnam. And uh, what we did was we got on these little boats and went down the Quabiet River into the Gulf of Tonkin where there were troop carriers waiting for us. And we got on the troop carriers, and we went from, from there, from the Gulf of Tonkin, back to Okinawa. We moved the whole 3rd Marine Division back there. So your experience, because that seems to be one of the, the problems a lot of guys I talk to when they talk about the Darrell system, the individual replacement, mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest criticisms, and one that I st it still amazes me, is the fact they have a guy fighting in the jungle. I'm sure, for, you know, from what you do later, you're, you're familiar with the story. Uh, if you fight in the jungle on uh, August the second and August the third, theoretically, he could be back in the streets of Albany. There was no decompression. Mm -hmm. uh, your experience was totally different. Yes, I think you could say that. I mean, we had the Dero State. We still rotated from Okinawa, but then we didn't, you know. Not from Vietnam. No, my whole company left at, at the same time. So there's all traditional World War II uh, <coughs> type of thing. You right. Went, you, you went back and boat together to Okinawa. That's yeah. That's very. That, that's 
You're right, that is very unusual. Well, see, I, you know, people talk about the Jiro State, but I'm not sure, I'm not completely convinced that it really would have made any difference. I mean, for, for what the Jiro's were set up for, it worked. Because during World War II and the Korean War, there were a lot of psychological casualties. Vietnam, there really weren't that many during the war, very, very, very low number. And that's part of what the, 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 the Duro state was set up for. And uh, it, it, it worked for the most part. But in terms of unity after we got back, I think that uh, it was a total failure. You're, you're introducing some things I'm not familiar with here. Uh, during Korea, you said there were psychological casualties during the war because of the way that the guys went in and out? Because of the actual war. See, one of the things that people don't realize is that, uh, and, and, you, and you see this a lot on TV and, and it gives you a really false sense of what goes on, is that uh, war is a really traumatic kind of thing. And when you put people in, in that kind of a situation, they react to it, like they come apart. And during Korea and World War II, there are a lot of men that that happened to, and women. Uh, I think the term, you know, like he's Section 8 mm -hmm. out of the service, or, you know, he's shell shocked, you know, those kinds of things. Battle right fatigue. Of, battle, yeah. Right. That happened right during the war in, uh, in large numbers in World War II in Korea. Oh, all right. Right during, as opposed to Vietnam, where most of it's going to take place afterwards. Okay. I never, I never Um, what was your reception when you got home? When I, from Vietnam? From Vietnam. Well, okay, when, well, I left Vietnam and I went to Okinawa and I spent, I was, I was in Okinawa about a month. And, uh, what? You just keep talking, I want to just check, go ahead. And, um, then I took the plane back to, uh, El Toro again. And oddly enough, we got El Toro at night, and we're in this big hangar, and uh, got our orders, gave us some money, and uh, I went up to, well, actually down to Hollywood for a while. No, that's up, up from there. Went up to Hollywood, stayed there a couple of days, got on the plane, and uh, went back home. Now, I would say my reception home was, especially with my friends, the guys I grew up with, it was kind of like I had went around to the store for a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, it was like, hey, Howard, what's going on? You know, they, you know, they really didn't ask me anything about what I had been through or what I did or whatever. You know, we just kind of picked up right where I left off. At. But I was, obviously, I had, I had changed greatly. Mm -hmm. And pretty much, uh, they stayed the same. I mean, because... What, what you hear a lot of Vietnam veterans say, at least I have, is that they went to Vietnam and they came back and everybody had changed. But in reality what had happened was that they went to Vietnam and went through this great change mm -hmm. and pretty much everybody, everybody stayed you know, pretty much the same, you know, just a gradual change that, that, that people go through. Uh, I think it was Ernie Mobb that makes a good point. He said, you know, he went over and he had to worry about survival for X number of months. And that whole thing, and he came back. The kids, kids for the most part, were his friends. Still worried about passing school. And, uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, yeah, there's no, there's, there's just no relationship between those two. You know, exactly. Um, and I, I think one, one of the things when you go into service and in, and then you go to Vietnam, or I should say, go into service and go to a war period, because I don't believe whether it's Vietnam or grenade or anything else, I, the same thing happens. But your priorities change. Um, one of, the, one of the things that, that, that people say that, you know, we went over to Vietnam and we came back men, and I disagree with that. I mean, we went, we went over to Vietnam and we came back kids who had been through a war, mm -hmm. young adults. I mean, we had the experience of war, but we still didn't have the, the experience that age gives you as you get older, mm -hmm. but things that you go through in life. Vietnam did not, did not give us that. So we were, you know, we were lacking all those things, but here we've just had this really intense life and death kind of situation, survival situation, and nobody to talk to about it. And 
not really knowing, at least for myself, not really knowing what to do with that. You know, most of us were males, and the way that males are brought up in the society is that males are supposed to be able to take it, endure it, you know, just put it aside. But we, you know, we were still relatively young, you know, just coming out of our adolescence. A very difficult time of development. Mm -hmm. for the John Wayne, uh, some guys refer to it as the John Wayne uh, stereotype, you know, uh, uh, practically what you said, you know, uh, you can take it and you don't cry, uh, the, the whole routine. Exactly. You know. Did, did you encounter any of the, the stereotype uh, receptions that Vietnam veterans received, uh, uh, maybe out in California? You know, uh, people taunt you, giving you a bad time or anything like that? No, no, none of that. That's, that's it. Were you surprised that your friend reacted that way? Or, or no? Did yeah, I think I, I was surprised. I was hurt. I think I was hurt because I think I wanted more of a reception. You know, like, glad to see you. I wanted them to ask me questions, and, and they didn't. I really, I never held it against them, but it was just, you know, it was a personal, you know, kind of disappointment. Uh, Hal Silverstein said, tape at the vet center, that he would not, it was difficult enough to come back to America, the Vietnam vet, and he said he could not imagine a would have been like to come back to Vietnam, come back from Vietnam both as a veteran and as a black. Could, could you react to that statement? Is there any truth in what he was saying? Oh, I, I, I believe so. I mean, anybody who lives in this country really, I think, should know that. I mean, even goes even goes back to Vietnam to give you an example that um, black soldiers didn't get the rank. I was a squad leader. I was a fire team leader. Um, I had certain responsibilities, you know, in, in, in Vietnam. And I was a private the whole time I was there. Jeez. And I had people under me that had more rank than I did. Um, I can't think of any other reason why I didn't, didn't get the rank. Um, minorities got a disproportionate amount of bad discharges. Who served honorably. When you, you look at the record, they served. What happened? They went into service with whatever branch served honorably here in the States, went to Vietnam, a lot of people distinguished themselves there, served honorably there, came back from Vietnam and started getting in trouble and the service just threw them out. They gave them these administrative discharges. They say, you want out? Here, we'll give you an undesirable, just sign here. You know, and they signed there, and not even knowing the ramifications that would have on their life later. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think, I, think, I think it was very difficult. Um, also, coming back when I, I got out of the service in, the, in 70, and, you know, in 1970, there were, there were a lot of, uh, I think there was a lot of friction going on between blacks and whites in this country. Even though there, were, there was a lot of awareness and a lot of good things going on, there, there, was, there was a lot of friction. And uh, unemployment at that time, if I remember correctly, inflation was, was beginning to zoom. Right. Uh, unemployment was getting was, was getting very high, and uh, not only there was a lot of discrimination going on towards Vietnam veterans, and you know, put on top of that, being black, the, the normal discrimination that goes on in jobs and education and those kinds of things was happening. So when you look at if you go back and you look at a place like California, you look at you know at some point at certain points in the 70s, like I believe in 1971, 72. You're looking at maybe 30 percent of all black Vietnam veterans were unemployed, you know, and, it, and I mean that's an that's an incredible number when you think that California sent more Vietnam veterans to Vietnam than any state. New York was second, so you're talking about a large number of people, you know, who are just out there. I didn't realize the numbers were that high. This, you know, how did you react to this? to this uh, dual discrimination, if you will? Well, see, I have to say for myself, I was very really lucky because um, a lot of times what they say is not what you know, it's who you, who you know. Yeah. And I, I, I was lucky enough to have been involved in, uh, with people that I didn't have to worry about getting a job. 
uh, I was really involved in my church when I when, when I was growing up. So I you know I knew people who you know who could get me a job, and so I just kind of mellowed out for a little bit and just took a couple of jobs. I, I like to I found my when I look back at it now I find that what how I first started out was doing a lot of solitary kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to be a truck driver because. You know, I just saw myself alone in my truck, you know, just going where I had to go, not having anybody to tell me what to do, because after being in the Marine Corps, you get tired of people telling, telling you what to do. do. Yeah, yeah, for they sure. Tell you everything. For sure. You know, sure. that you know that wasn't really for me. Plus, I did some work with kids. You know, then I thought, well, it was during the Alaskan pipeline, and I thought it would be. I always wanted to operate heavy equipment, uh -huh. so I thought it might be fun to go to Alaska. To work on the pipeline until I realized how cold it was. <laughs> but anyway, I, I learned how to operate heavy equipment and I did, you know, I did some of that work and I went to school a little bit. And I still work with kids. And then I just decided to do that full time. So I started working with kids and going to school. And pretty much I've been doing that same kind of work. Uh -huh. what, what kind of work do you do with kids? Uh, well, let's see. Lots of it, huh? <laughs> I worked with uh, I worked with adolescents um, in the after school program. You might be familiar with the Project Stride. Yeah. Uh, I worked there. Um, I worked uh, at Parsons Child Family Center in their group home program, community residence with with adolescents. And, and from there, I, I started doing more administrative kinds of things. Uh, actually, running. I was a supervisor. They had five group homes. And I supervised the five. And then for about the past 10 years, you know, in, in between doing, while I was doing that, I was working, doing some family work and working with families and, and kids. And then I've been working with, at the vet center, working with Vietnam veterans and their families, you know, for what, eight, I think it's eight years or nine years or whatever. So I'm just long supported in existence. I was the first counselor they hired there. I think it was at the time it was in existence. It, do you, uh, do you share the view that uh, was prevalent on civil rights groups, especially in the later 60s, that uh, the Vietnam War was a war fought by mi minorities for white or, you know, for majority business interests? Do you think there's any validity to that statement? Well, I, you know, I have to say, you know, to, 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 to go back, when I, when I came back from Vietnam, you know, I was, like, real angry. And I don't think I, I was really any different than anybody else in my age group at that time, because sometimes, you know, I'm still 20 years old, still basically an adolescent, yeah. I, I think a lot of times we're real angry about things and we're not quite sure what we're angry about. I got involved with the Black Panther Party, and uh, my first wife was involved in, in a group called the Patriot Party in New York, and she was also involved in SDS. So, I started getting involved in, in those kinds of things, and I started reading a lot of Mao, you know, a, a lot of that kind of literature. And uh, at that time, it, it made sense to me, and I have to say that some of it still makes sense to me. Um, and also, I was very involved in, in community. Um, uh, people think of the Black Panther Party, and they think, you know, carrying a gun and off the pig and things like that, but, but the, also the Black Panther Party started uh, the first free breakfast programs, a lot of clothing programs, food, food co-ops, a lot of the, uh, the, fruit, the breakfast programs that uh, schools have is modeled after the Black Panther Party. So I was involved in a lot of that and in a lot of organizing, that kind of organizing welfare rights and uh, I was involved in starting a food co-op you know, doing, doing those kinds of things. But I, but I also had a real radical end to me. Um, like I was in New Haven, when Bobby Seale had his trial up there and they called out the National Guard at Yale. Um, I was in some demonstrations in New York and uh, I was, uh, you know, I was questioned by the FBI on, on, on numerous occasions because of my involvements and you know, the pictures that were taken me with, 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 with certain people. Was this an Albany-based uh, Panthers organization or New York well, State? Well, actually, they in the beginning they had a small Panther office here, but it wasn't really successful. But mainly, I did a lot of stuff out of New York. 
of the, of the Manhattan office. Uh, the, I'm trying to think the uh, civil rights movement in Albany, if, if you will, the, other than the brothers, were, were there any other vocal organizations? I mean, I wasn't even aware there was even a Panther small, that the Panthers even had an organization mm -hmm. up there. Well, with I don't think, you know, really, you know, Albany, as you said earlier, Albany has always been a very conservative town. And uh, I think the civil rights movement went, went right along with uh, the peace movement. There really wasn't any big, you know, movement except except for the brothers. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the way the city of Albany is set up, it's really, in a lot of ways, especially if you go back then, you go back into the 60s, what you're going to find is a lot of ethnic neighborhoods in Albany. Correct, right. And, uh, and I think that ethnic neighborhoods are, are nice and, and they're great, but I think it creates a lot of isolation am amongst people. And I think that's, that's what it did there. So that I, no, there wasn't any really big civil rights movement. I can't, I can't remember. I, I know there was a, a demonstration at one point on Pearl Street, and you know some of the, some of the activities of the brothers. Uh, right. But you know, as far as a, a sustained effort. Uh, well, I remember that there was a demonstration that really wasn't a big demonstration, and they and there was a lot of demonstrations going on all around the country at that time. Mm -hmm. And I remember the police cars with the. Uh, the metal mesh. The, the metal yes, mesh yeah. over there. And, I, and yeah. I, on Central Avenue, I remember, I remember uh, police standing on each corner with shotguns. So that was a deterrent, I think, yeah, yeah. For, for people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. What, um, you associated with the Panthers. Did it, did, did it change your attitude towards the war? Well, I think my attitude be begin to change towards the war, you know, as the years went on. After I started to reflect on on uh, what what had happened, and at that time there wasn't a lot of literature out about Vietnam, right, right. and but just reflecting on on what my own experience was based on what was happening in this country, um, it became quite clear to me that that there was something wrong. That uh, personally myself and 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 this is a personal view, you know, I believe that the Vietnam War was a mistake. Uh, we were fighting on the wrong side. And there are, <laughs> and there are Vietnam veterans who, who, who will strongly disagree with me, and they have that right, you know, as, as Americans. But uh, myself, I think when you look at the history of Vietnam, when you look at the history of our involvement in Vietnam, right on back to the 40s, where a lot of people don't realize that Ho Chi Minh and, and, and those people were our allies against the Japanese in, in Vietnam. It was apparent that we were, we were on the wrong side. Did you ever read uh, the band uh, Bright Shines On? Mm -hmm. And uh, he, they, the guy who does it, it does a remarkable uh, uh, introduction, in which he talks about Ho Chi Minh writing letters to Washington, you know, pleading for American assistance and American yes. help, you know. Over and over and over again, you know. Uh, See, I have my views on that, and 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 again, those views are are, are based in. Uh, you have to start talking about racism in America again. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's any coincidence that if 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 you look at the the French occupied Vietnam for a hundred years, we just had a war. Where we dropped two nuclear bombs on on the on the Japanese, we had interred uh, Japanese American citizens in you know in, in this country, you put put them in basically concentration camps, and uh, what Ho Chi Minh was asking, he was asking to go against the French, who who, who are our allies, which is a European country, mm -hmm. and uh, and now we're talking about Truman. And right around, also right around that time, the 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 North Koreans crossed the 38th parallel with the Chinese. So I, you know, so I, I think there was still a lot of ill feelings against Oriental people because of because of the Second World War, because of of the way the Japanese treated American prisoners, not only American prisoners but the English prisoners mm -hmm. in Burma, you know, and, and and those things. I think those feelings were 
still very, very raw. And I think that contributed to, to some of the decisions that, that were made. Just simple racism against them. Uh, I believe that, yeah. yes. Somebody made the point, you know, when uh, uh, we drop bombs on Japan, but our biggest enemy during World War II was Germany. Uh, you know, I forgot what I saw that. That's a good point about mm -hmm. the Japanese concentration camps because there were a good number of German citizens in the United States and they were never, uh, uh, they were never put in the concentration camps. Or they, they lost a couple of businesses, maybe they had to change their names, but uh, they certainly were subjected to that, that type. And also, too, I, th I think one of the interesting things is is the most decorated unit ever in the army was the Japanese unit in World War II. So you know, you know, you look at you know, you look at those kinds of things, and uh, and and I think, you know, I think that's important because I think that played itself out in in, in Vietnam too. You know, minorities took a lot of casualties in in, in Vietnam. You know, as I said earlier, I had the responsibility, but but no rank. When you when you in Vietnam, when you when you looked at the jobs in the rear, basically what you what you found, they were occupied by the majority of the white veterans, mm -hmm. and especially later in the war, when you look at who's out in the field during during the fighting, you're going to find that large numbers of them are black, or Hispanic, or Native American. So, so you basically feel that, uh, that statement that you know was made by the groups uh, in the late sixties has a certain amount of accuracy to it that the disproportionate number of minorities were fighting the war and being killed. They were fighting the war. I wouldn't say yes. A disproportionate amount were actually doing the fighting, not necessarily in terms of the amount of minorities in country, mm -hmm. but the but when you look at how many are out do, actually doing the fighting. Very, yes, disproportionate. How long did, uh, with, with the, the Panthers, did, how long did you maintain your affiliation? Or they just kind of, they just kind of die out, did they, they? Well, they, they died out around here. I mean, they were a national organization uh, <clears throat> a couple of years. A couple of years. It got to be too dangerous for me. I mean, you have to realize they had just left the place where people were shooting yeah. each other. And I had no, uh, I didn't want to get shot at anymore. <laughs> I, I, I can, uh, don't blame you. Don't blame you at all. Uh, so, how were you, were you in Albany during, during the 70s, during that amnesia time? Uh, for the most part. I lived in San Francisco for a while, too. That's a beautiful, beautiful place. We lived out in California for a couple of years when I, when I was a kid. Uh, were, were you involved in any of the, like, you see, the, like the VBA started around 1980? Did you become involved in any of those veteran movements as they first developed? Well, I, no. I would have to say that uh, pretty much during the 70s, I didn't talk about the war. I didn't say much about the war. Um, a lot of people never knew that I was even in the service. I was around conversations where people would talk about it, but I never said anything. And I, I don't know why. I can't, I can't say I was really afraid to. Um, I just didn't. Uh, Did you get caught up in that amnesia, like the rest of us, or you know? I think I, I think I think I think I probably did. The, the stereotypes that were running rampant in the seventies, uh, uh, the crazy Vietnam veteran. Uh, no, I never thought I never thought that because I always knew that I was a Vietnam veteran, and I never felt that I was crazy. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, you know, you, you had all those uh, different kinds of stereotypes. Uh, that the different guys talk about that. That's one. Uh, uh, the fact that it was quote the first war, the war we ever lost. You know that was another one. You know, let's take a time out for a second. I'll introduce my wife. Okay. Is that my wife? I hope it's my wife. She's, she's right away. She's going to rearrange. Hello. Hello. I didn't know what was going on. I could see all these lights from outside. Hello. This is Dorothy's friend Howard. Johnson, this is my wife. Hi, Anna. Howard. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You're being interviewed, I yeah, take we, it. Yes. I could take see a break the bit. lights. Sure. I didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> well, is that one just keep you're going? Filming, yeah. You're filming this okay. with a pillow on the couch. 
You can't see it. We only can see oh, him. Okay. Believe me. See, I mean, they come in right away and they want to start. I'm going to rearrange. Re redecorate, redecorate stuff. So, you know, like some of the stereotypes that ran rampant were that, you know, but this was the first war we'd ever lost. And, you know, just from different guys that told me, you know. Well, that's not a stereotype. That's the truth. That's the truth. Okay, that's the truth. <laughs> All right. See, I think you know, that's, something that, that's something that Vietnam veterans and Americans have to come to grips with, is that uh, we didn't win the war. Um, and it wasn't that the veterans lost the war. Americans, we, I mean, as a country, we lost the war. I mean, in 1973, we pulled all the American troops out. In 1975, Saigon fell. So, you know, you can say we lost the war, you can say, well, we didn't, we gave up and we left, and then the Vietnamese lost the war. Uh, I don't believe it was winnable. Right? And if you look at history, if you study history, and if you look at Vietnam as a civil war, when you have North Vietnamese fighting South Vietnamese, I don't, I don't see how you can call it anything else but a civil war. I mean, they are the same people. And uh, third parties always lose in civil wars. You know, um, if you look at our civil war and you, and you look at the countries who really didn't get involved be, because of that, you know, they didn't really send troops over because they, you know, they knew that third parties always lose. Right, right. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good point. It's like fighting, it's like getting in the middle of a fight between two brothers. <laughs> so you don't accept the theory that uh, uh, the domino, uh, the uh, we are fighting communist aggression, you don't see that being valid at all here. I mean, that's why they went, but it's really, they were, they were wrong. It was a mistake. No, I think that, I, I, I believe that that's the same ruse that, that, that they've been using uh, for years and years and years and years, and, and that's, old, that's old Cold War rhetoric. Yeah. If, you, if you look at in the 50s, they had everybody uh, building bomb shelters in their, in their backyards and, and doing all this thing. I can, I can remember when I was in school that we used to have nuclear bomb drills where you, where you got under your desk. But when you look at the reality of nuclear war, what would happen? I mean, what if you get under your desk so you can see the wall disintegrate, yeah. or your classmates disintegrate, or the, I know that those the bomb shelters were called graves, because that's pretty much what they would have been, uh, fighting communist aggression, no. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that. As far as I know, until I went to Vietnam, the communists never did anything to me. <laughs> uh, as a black man, as, uh, as, as a black man, I mean, that, I, that's one of the things that would towards the end of the war that was being said. You know, uh, and, uh, Vietnamese never refused me a job. Right. Vietnamese never, you know, refused me to, to stay in, in any place. And right. Vietnamese never, you know, never attacked me until I came over here to their country. So, in, in far as I know, Russians or nobody like that is, has ever done anything. Right. Right. And the ones I met when I was on r and &R in Hong Kong were extremely friendly people. <laughs> so I, I don't believe that. How did you get involved with Girl at the, the Vet Center? Well, that's, well, it's funny. My mother's a social worker for, for the VA. She's been working there for almost 30 years. And her supervisor was a friend of the, the original team leader there, and they were looking they, want, they wanted to find a minority who was a Vietnam combat veteran, but also had worked in human services. So my mother asked me at this time I was working for Parsons if I knew anybody. I said, I knew a couple of people. I mean, I was very comfortable with Parsons. I had just gotten a promotion. And, you know, and, uh, so, you know, I talked to a couple of people. And then my wife and my mother said, you should apply for the job. I said, eh, I don't know. And I said, okay. And I applied for the job and they hired me. Because yeah, you, you fit all the, you know, <laughs> that's not, you know, you can't find those, all those qualifications walking around the right. street, that's for sure. But that's unusual qualifications. What kind, what kind of work do you do there? Can you just, uh, yeah. well, if I do, uh, I do individual counseling. 
I do uh, group counseling. I do uh, couples counseling. Um, I work with battered women. Um, I work with batterers. Um, and we do education, and, you know, things like this, public speaking. Uh, work with incarcerated vets. Whatever it calls for. What do you What do you see being uh, in Maybe you can generalize a little bit. Based upon this experience you've had in eight or nine years at the vet center, what do you see being the biggest problems that Vietnam veteran faces uh, uh, in the 90s? The biggest problem in the 90s? Well, that problems. That's a, that's a tough question. I would have to say, you know, um, I'd have to say maybe Agent Orange because it's, it's, like, a, it's like herbicides or anything else. It's, it's a, it's a silent killer, and it's like a, a time bomb ticking, and you don't know whether something's going to go wrong with you or something's not. So I think that just in terms of cre creating anxiety, I think that, that, that that's a problem. Uh, I, also, I also see maybe um, acceptance, Vietnam veterans being able to accept themselves in terms of the, the, the whole experience and not seeing themselves as being so different and so, and so unique from, from everybody else in society. And being able to forgive about you know the whole experience, the homecoming, you know, in the whole country is uh, probably I would I would think the biggest problem. Uh, your your first point, I heard on the news coming home today that uh, the Supreme Court or the, the Congress just awarded umpteen million dollars uh, to World War II guys who were involved in the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. Uh, similar, similar to the Agent Orange situation, just forty mm -hmm. years before. Uh, yeah, that, that's indirectly is a, is, a, is a victory for you guys. Uh, probably with no awareness of that uh, without the Agent Orange issue. I know when, they, when the newscaster was talking about it, it was some of the same kind of arguments that have been used uh, in the Agent Orange situation. Well, this, this is, you know, unfortunately, people don't study the history of our wars, especially in this century. This is nothing new. If you look at World War One, and 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 from far as I'm concerned, World War One and Vietnam veterans probably have more in common than any other group of veterans. I mean, when you when you look at what happened with World War One veterans, when even when they got into the war, their reception by the Europeans, uh, the way they came back, um, people forget about uh, the the gases that were used mm -hmm. in World War One, and these guys came back and there wasn't any VA. There wasn't anybody to, 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 to help them. The respiratory problems, the skin ailments, uh, you know, all these kinds of things that and the, these men suffered, you know, and uh, they did a lot of things that, that Vietnam veterans did. I mean, uh, you know, you read the novels, uh, and John Steinbeck writes about this, you know, traveling the rails, and, make it sound so exotic, but a lot of these men were World War II veterans, and uh, they were very troubled men, and they stayed together, they congregated together, and they traveled all, all around the country. Uh, Vietnam veterans did a lot of that in, in, in the very beginning. Uh, they really didn't get the homecoming that they probably deserved, not probably that they, that they did deserve. And they had to fight the government for every single thing that they got. Mm -hmm. uh, during prior to the creation of the VA, World War One veterans marched on the Capitol. Mm -hmm. The bonus army. That's right. Sure. They were, uh, and I believe that uh, General mm -hmm. MacArthur was commanding those troops when they shot them mm -hmm. with machine guns, yeah. burned down their tent city. I mean, that's in a lot of ways that's no different than, than what happened to to uh, Vietnam veterans. So the, you know, there's a lot, a lot of comparisons to be made, especially with the herbicides and the chemicals and the, you know, the nuclear uh, radiation. So I think that you know, if there's a lesson to be learned. I, I believe that the government has to be accountable for what it does to its its soldiers. How serious do you think the PTSD problem is? is that PTSD, I think, is very serious. I mean, 
And a lot of times we just want to talk about it with Vietnam veterans, but as I said earlier, anytime you expose people to that kind of trauma, you're, you're, you're going to have those problems. There's PTSD in World War I, World War II veterans, I think. In a lot of ways, World War II veterans, I think, suffered more than we, than, than we did. Because at least Vietnam veterans can stand up and say, okay, this happened to us because we went to a war. World War II veterans couldn't say that. I mean, they had to suffer in silence. How many families were broken up? How many people committed suicide? How many people died of alcoholism due to the fact that they were drinking to, to, to try to forget? And uh, when you talk to Vietnam veterans who fathers of World War II veterans, you see a lot of this. And if you look at the VA after World War II, you see all these guys up there for alcoholism. And, and they put them on the psych wards then and just left them. You know, and during the 50s when they were developing all the, the uh, psychiatric drugs like Thorazine and, and those kinds of things, they, you know, they, that's what they gave these guys. They told them, hey, just sit down in the corner and, and forget. But I think it's a, it's a very serious problem. Anytime anybody goes to war, you're forever changed. And, and I think that that's one of the things that happened to Vietnam veterans, that we went to war and we wanted to come back and we wanted things to be the same for us. We want to kind of pick up our lives where we left off. And it's impossible. And you can never, ever do that. And, and I think, you know, when you talk about how young we were, I mean, the mean age was 19. Obviously, we had people there older, but obviously we had people there younger, 17 and 18. To think at 17, 18, 19 years old that your life is just like, completely changed. Very important time in your life. And so I think that's, you know, that's a very difficult thing for, I say for us, because, you know, I'm no different. I, you know, I have my problems. And certain things will, will probably always bother me. I mean, you learn to uh, live with your experience and incorporate that in, in parts of your life now, because you can never change it. And that's why, like, you know, like, Vietnam counseling, that's, you know, I mean, that's such a noble work because when I mean, you get the experience, I can't identify. I would mean, never really identify and talk to probably 40 or 50 guys of the experiences and, you know, and they just, they well, just can't do it. Well, one of the things I talk about it is, is that, no, I don't expect people to be able to identify with my experience. How can anybody identify with being up in the DMZ, right. you know? and being mortared and shelled and having your friends die and, and get hurt. Well, the guys who share that experience are going to talk to somebody that they can identify with. Right. You know? But I think that people can share and do share the feelings part of it. And I'll give, give you an example. See, I look at war as a trauma, okay? And I was traumatized because I was fighting a war and I saw certain things happen. And I lost a friend. I know people who lost friends in car accidents, and they were traumatized. And I think the thing that I share with them, that we share together, is that we can talk about what it feels like to lose somebody close to you that we care about. It really makes no difference how they die, right. you know, as long as it's traumatic, a car accident is traumatic, or what if they're shot in the street, innocent bystander. Um, we, can we can share that, because I think people tend to do a lot of the similar kinds of things when they have these kind of feelings. Um, uh, I think that rape victims and, and, and combat veterans have a lot. Crime victims have a lot in common that they can share. Uh, that fear, uh, the fear of losing your life that, that it's going to be over. I mean, I think that's very similar. I think that we can talk about that and, and how that's affected our lives. And, and when I talk to guys, I, I try not, I really don't want them to lose sight of that because I think that when you see yourself as being so unique and so alone, I, I think it hurts you. Even though the Vietnam experience was a unique experience, but the feelings part of it is which is what we all deal with after we come back. Is like, you know, what's going on in your life? How do you feel about that? What do you do about that? The, the isolation you mentioned, you want to be a truck driver, you know, that seemed to be a common response that a lot of guys is just to isolate <coughs> themselves 
you know, the bee by themselves, uh, one of the guys on the tape here, uh, uh, Bart Mikowski, you probably know him up there. That's what he says. He says, all I want to do is be, you can still see him, all I want to do is be left eye all alone, you know. I think I said it three or four times, and we talked about, you know, when he first came back and his, uh, and his reaction. Well, I talk, when guys say that to me, I, you know, that's a very easy statement to say, I want to be left alone. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> I mean, it, on the surface, it's a very simple statement, but generally it, it, it means a lot of very complex things for, for, for the person who's saying it. I mean, be, being left alone could mean, you know, for some guys, uh, not to hearing negative things about mm -hmm. Vietnam. Right. You know, to be left alone, they could be talking about, they would just like to forget it. Maybe they're having uh, intrusive thoughts about some of their experiences. Uh, maybe they're dealing with the government and the government is intriguing them fairly from their perspective. I mean, they could mean that. Or maybe they could mean, you know, they just don't want to be bothered with, with, with anybody. Which, if you look at Vietnam veterans, really isn't true. Because Vietnam veterans like to organize, they like to be around each other and other people. They do a lot of, you know, a lot of different things. So uh, even the even the veterans, which they call the tripwire vets, who kind of went off in the woods, and more and more of these people are coming back. You know, they're coming they're coming back to the mainstream. So uh, when when a Vietnam veteran tells me that he or she wants to be left alone, um, I don't take that for face for value. value. For face uh -huh. value, it's a, it's it's a, it's a form of protection. I mean, because we came back and we were looking for people to say things to us like "good job" or "glad you're back" or whatever, and then you do, you don't get that, then the natural reaction is to say, "Well, I don't care. You just leave me alone." And if you, and these are behaviors that have been developed over years and years and years and years and years. And when you look at the age of the people who were saying that, that's pretty appropriate behavior. I mean, that's how people that age act generally. But that just that continued over over years and years and years. That's, that's a good point. One of the uh, you had mentioned earlier one of the one of the purposes for doing this uh, series is our hope that they'll be shown to the high school kids throughout the capital district. You mentioned what you felt already was a very significant lesson of the war, and that is that government has to be responsible for the soldiers uh, or his soldiers. Do you see any other lessons, any other things coming out that this generation uh, should learn from, from your experience? Well, not just from my experience, I think just from the whole experience of the, of the, of the Vietnam War, um, how brutal it really is. Uh, I know that, that the armed services now have been targeting high school kids to get them to go to go into the service, and, and kids should realize when you go into service, it could be a great experience, but also know that you could also end up in a war, and and if that happens, like I said before, your life is forever changed. You know, I also see grenade events, and I've seen got one of the Iranian hostages, and uh, this is very short-term stuff, and it still had the same effect on these men. Uh, I, was, I would say that, that as a high school student, you probably should really check out what's going on. I mean, the uniforms look nice, and they talk real nice about what, they can, what you can do and, and what you can't do. But the reality of a military is to fight wars. It's, and they say it's to keep peace, but I see it's to fight wars, because that's how they keep the peace, by fighting the war and winning. And in that way, you keep the peace. So that's, I would say that's the lesson to learn. Are there any final, final thoughts before we wrap this up? Any parting comments? Is there anything I forgot to, to, <laughs> to, 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 to mention? Or anything that you want to say? Well, no, I'd just like to thank you for, you know, for, for talking with me. Um, as I told you before, I always, I believe that, that uh, people should know about the Vietnam War because it's a real important part of their history and um, they should try to get things that are accurate and 
the people who can do that are the people who were, were in the war. At least I can talk about my little part of the war, and what I did, and what I saw, and how I feel about it. And, hope, and hopefully that uh, somebody will be able to relate to that and get a better understanding about what, you know, at least part of what the Vietnam War was about for an individual. Which is where it was at, for individuals. For individuals, as all yeah. wars are. Yeah, that's what it always comes down to. Howard, I want to thank you so very, very much. Thank you. You were great. <laughs> you were great. <laughs> Uh, it's just you know, it's so much to talk about. It's like, yeah, it's uh, 